Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Lauren, and I'm here today with ICR research scientist and zoologist, Dr. Frank Sherwin. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Sherwin. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. So let's talk about parasites. You have studied them intensively, if I'm not mistaken, and you even discovered a species. Well, that's right. Uh, Parasites are ubiquitous. We find them all over the world and they uh, inhabit people and plants and animals. And so everything, almost everything, has some kind of parasite as we define them. So how would you define parasite? What makes a parasite a parasite? And what does a creature have to do to kind of be lumped into that category? (laughs) Well, parasites are usually smaller than the host that they inhabit. And they can inhabit on the external, the skin. We call them ectoparasites, uh, like uh, ticks or mites or something like that. And then we have internal parasites, endoparasites. And they are like the helminths. Now, helminth is a word for worm. And so when you think of somebody that has a parasite, usually you think of worms, those are the helminths. And we have different kinds of worms like the roundworms. So in answer to your question, I did some research in the mountains of Colorado where I shot about 35 tree swallows and these tree swallows were all 100% infected with parasites. And the swallows would feed in the evening and also in the early morning. So that's a time I had to get up there. And so I collected about 35. And sure enough, in the stomach lining of one of these tree swallows, I found a glistening white worm and I very carefully extracted it and found out that it had never been discussed by science. And so I named it Acuaria coloradensis. And of course, coloradensis, because I found it In Colorado. See how hazy science is? Yes, it's a cinch. (laughs) So there are a lot of parasites out there, and some of them are extremely dangerous. What are some examples of deadly or even terrifying parasites? Oh, boy. Well, there's a whole bunch of them out there. And, of course, the most common is probably the parasite that causes malaria. It's called plasmodium. It's a single-celled creature, and it causes malaria. The plasmodium parasite is spread by, of course, a mosquito. The female mosquito takes a meal from the person, and it leaves the special uh, immature stages of the parasite that migrates to the liver, and then the person comes down with one of four different kinds uh, of malaria. Uh, The most devastating is plasmodium falciparum. That's the most devastating. There's There's at least three other of the malarias that people can get, but that's the most devastating. So what causes it to be so devastating? What does that parasite do to the human body that makes that causes such devastating things? Well, basically what happens is it, it sets up shop within the liver, so a person has a hepatic disease to some extent, but also the parasite is in gets into the red blood cells of an individual and they multiply within the red blood cells and then they burst out of the red blood cells and then they go on to infect other red blood cells. And so that continues. And maybe you've seen movies or hear stories about people in a tropical area that have the shivers and the shakes and all that. That's the body responding to these merozoites, that small little parasites that burst out of the red blood cells and it causes a a type of a shock that the person Mm. goes into. And so that's very devastating for an individual. uh, individual. It it wears down basically their um, immune system and they use a lot of energy in the chills and the fevers and they shake. And usually it's people that can't afford to, to use excess energy. They're usually in third world countries. It's very, very tragic. And so yeah, basically we find that malaria kills millions of people every year, most of them children and most of them in Africa. So what are some other really scary parasitic relationships that we see in creation? Well, for example, in the Middle East, we find that there is a parasite called Dracunculus medinensis. Quite a name. (laughs) Which uh, goes by the name of a guinea worm. And this guinea worm is found in fresh water, particularly wells. 
Now, how does that guinea worm get to the person? Well, the answer is a tiny invertebrate, a tiny creature called a copepod. Copepods are almost microscopic. You can hardly see them. So when people go to the well, they step into the water of the well, and they take a drink of the water and necessarily ingest a copepod or two. And in these copepods is the immature stage of the guinea worm. So once the water, uh, the person takes in the water, the copepod, pod breaks apart and the guinea worm evades our immune system and establishes itself in the person. And then the female worm migrates to the lower extremities, the legs and the feet of the individual. And then she secretes a special, what we call a proteolytic enzyme. It's an enzyme that breaks down protein in our skin and our muscle. Our connective tissue is made of protein. Pretty soon, that individual gets an ulcer on their foot. And the ulcer then breaks when uh, water is around it. That it, uh, it immediately breaks, it ruptures, and a loop of the, the parasite comes out of that ulcerated area there. And so when the person is in the water, that loop of the parasite ruptures and releases hundreds of thousands of these immature stages oh, of the parasite. No, so it'll spread even further to others. Exactly. And then the copepods uh, love to eat those, and the copepods eats those immature stages, and the cycle continues. Maybe you have seen, for example, a person who takes a matchstick and then they twist the matchstick one time every 24 hours to pull out that female worm without rupturing it. And then they, and it may take quite a long time to keep wrapping uh, that worm around that how matchstick. Long can they, how long can they get? Oh, they get pretty long, uh, you know, but like a foot or so. Ooh. Yeah, and, and so it that all depends terrifying. on how long. Now, the good news to this you know, the skin crawling story is that the guinea worm, Dracunculus metanensis, is on the way out. And it looks okay. like within our generation, you won't have it anymore because in order to stop getting infected, all they have to do is stop uh, drinking the water unless they filter it or they can heat the water and kill the copepod. So those are easy ways to, um, to avoid getting infected. Right here in North America and in South America, there's a single-celled protozoan parasite called the trypanosome, and it causes a disease called trypanosomiasis. In Africa, trypanosomiasis is called sleeping sickness. Maybe you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. And the sleeping sickness, trypanosomiasis, is spread by uh, a, a fly, and this fly takes in a blood meal and leaves its calling card, which then a person is infected with this sleeping sickness. In South America, it's a special bug called the regivided bug. And when people sleep on the floor, and they don't necessarily have to sleep on the floor, they can sleep on a little bed or whatever, and these regivided bugs, bugs in South America come out of the ceiling, come down, and then they find a person sleeping there, crawl up into their face, Ooh. and they skewer the skin just underneath the eye mm. and take in a blood meal. And they leave what's called a metacyclic trypanosome stage on the skin of the individual. When they wake up, they rub their eyes, and they infect themselves with these trypanosomes. And so as the person goes through life there in South America, they may get reinfected and reinfected. And unfortunately, the parasite sets up what's called pseudocysts within the heart or the esophagus of the individual, causing the cardiac conduction of the individual to be affected. So they have uh, a heart attack at a young age, or their esophagus might get huge and cause problems with swallowing and all. So that has to do with the person getting reinfected with this um, particular trypanosome. That is the stuff of nightmares. Next time I pick up a glass of water or wake <laughs> up in the morning and rub my eyes, I'm going to think of you, Dr. Sherwin. <laughs> So what's the reason? It sounds like an attack. So is there like a reason behind that attack? Why does the parasite latch onto the host in such a destructive way? Well, there's various theories behind that, but I think maybe we can go ahead and read in Scripture about what happened and in, in God uh, cursed the earth after the fall of our first uh, parents, Adam and Eve. And in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. 
Verse 18, Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, thou shalt return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken. And so what we find is that when God created the world, everything was very good, but then Adam and Eve fell, and that was the, the, the fall which resulted in the corruption of God's very good creation. And then here in Genesis chapter 3, we see that God cursed the earth. And so we find that parasites are part of this curse. And we as creation scientists believe that maybe parasites had a more mellow type of a function prior to God cursing the earth. And so maybe these parasites that we're talking about had another, what we would call in biology, a symbiotic or even a mutualistic type of a uh, relationship with people and animals and plants prior to the fall. But one thing is for sure, some parasites, as you mentioned, can be very, very devastating. Clearly, there are a lot that are devastating. Are there any that are neutral or even beneficial to the host? Well, this is a fascinating area of biology, and in particular, parasitology, where scientists are looking into. We're finding that some parasites, as long as you have a good nutritional balance, uh, you wouldn't even know that you had a parasite. Wow. That would be, for example, like the, uh, the cattle parasite. We get parasites from cattle, it's called the beef tapeworm. That doesn't seem to have any kind of uh, a negative type of a situation, whereas the pork tapeworm that we get from pigs can be not only devastating, it can be fatal in uh, some conditions. It's called cystocercosis, and sometimes people get a cyst in their brain and that it expands, and, and uh, obviously that's not very good. Um, they're finding out now that people who have various diseases, if they have a parasite, that disease is not as bad as it usually would be. For example, with multiple sclerosis, we find that patients with multiple sclerosis, if they have a potpourri of parasites, the MS conditions don't seem to be as bad. Wow, have they figured out why that is? Not figured it out yet, but it's quite fascinating, and so they're still looking into that. That's a really interesting correlation that I would not have seen coming. Yeah. So some of them can even potentially be beneficial. Mm -hmm. According to secular science, where do parasites come from? Well, according to secular scientists, they really don't know the origin of parasites. And when it comes to both the origin and the evolution, and by that we mean macro evolution. Macro means obviously big, the big changes that occur. How is it that parasites came about and how is it that they changed in order to infect people and animals and plants? The evolutionists have come up empty handed. They simply don't know. And I'm not criticizing them, but we have, I think, a better model. We have a model that says thousands of years ago, in the beginning, God created everything very good, as I'd mentioned. And then when Adam and Eve sinned, then we find that God cursed the earth. And so we have the origin, if you will, of parasites from, we believe, to be a more mutualistic, symbiotic relationship prior to the curse. And it seems to fit. Now, we're still doing research in that, and that's why we're called the Institute for Creation Research. But we think the research will continue to uncover, to unearth some of these uh, answers to questions that uh, people are asking regarding parasites and pathogenesis in particular. Okay, so you would argue that they have not always been negative and that they did not come about. Parasites still existed before the fall, but they had different functions. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. We wouldn't even call them parasites at that hmm. time because parasites imply a smaller creature living at the expense, either neutral, neutral or even beneficial, but most of the time deleterious to their host. And so we feel that probably that uh, these parasites had a, a more mutualistic, beneficial uh, function prior to the fall. Do you have any idea, I know you mentioned with multiple sclerosis, that there could be a potentially beneficial relationship there. Can you think of other ways that before the fall they might have had more of a beneficial relationship with the host? Well, not offhand. There's, there's still more research that needs to be done in that. But we find that uh, some parasites can give off a type of a hormone that might be beneficial to the individual. And so there's a, a field of studying hormones, the endocrine system, that might be affected 
by the parasite. And so that's a very fruitful area of research that's currently being done. So you mentioned the phrase symbiotic relationship. What is the difference between a parasitic relationship and a symbiotic relationship? How would you define that? Good. You know, parasitic relationship is the parasite is feeding off of the individual to the benefit of the parasite, but definitely not to the individual. That's probably the best uh, definition of a parasite. Now, symbiosis is, is something a little bit different where both the host and the smaller animal are benefiting in some way. So as you go backpacking in the forest, and sometimes you'll see some rocks that have a crusty growth on it, that is called a lichen. A lichen really is two creatures living together, a fungus and an algae, and they live in a symbiotic relationship, one depending on the other and vice versa. And the living world is full of such examples as that. Hmm. So originally parasites could have had a symbiotic relationship before the fall with their host. We believe so. We believe that perhaps we might be missing something and that there was an original symbiotic relationship between an animal and the what would later become the parasite or even the person and what would later become the parasite. And so we're investigating that, we're researching that, because we don't believe that God created parasites after the fall. We believe that parasites existed as some kind of creature. And in biology, we call them a free living creature. So they live free in the environment. And there's a very interesting type of a nematode, which is a roundworm, that exists free in the environment. But if a person were to get infected, you know, taking in that parasite, that parasite would immediately establish itself in the host. Mm. And so they can live free in the environment, but if a person gets in the way of their life cycle, we call it in biology a zoonotic infection, then they would be, uh, that person would be infected. So we think maybe there's a connection there within creation science in explaining the origin of parasitism after God cursed the earth. Do you have anything else you wanted to tell us about parasites and symbiotic relationships? Well, of course, we can see how devastating and deleterious the parasites are, but as people of faith, we have a, a commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is a creator of everything. And we understand that in the beginning, God created, and that it was our first parents who fell, uh, and we're in the situation we're in right now. But thankfully, God has provided a route of escape, and that is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as, as we acknowledge him, and the work that he's done on the cross on our behalf, we would acknowledge that and become, as it says in John chapter 3, born again. And so, yes, we have all this devastation, the protozoan parasites, the carnivores, the COVID, but we rejoice as Christians that someday God will usher in a new heaven and a new earth, and we look forward to that time. So as much destruction as we see in this fallen world, we know that our Creator is also our Savior. And that is such a comfort as we continue to live in this fallen world. So thank you so much for all that you've shared with us today about parasites, symbiotic relationships, everything to do with those things. That's been really interesting. I appreciate your talking with us today. My pleasure. And to our viewers, thank you again for tuning in today. Be sure to subscribe. You can access the Creation Podcast anywhere you usually access your podcast, YouTube, Spotify, and others. Again, I'm Lauren, and we'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast.